Hi, Al Williams with Hackaday here. I was doing the post on using the iStick FPGA board, and we're going to use the native tools to actually configure that FPGA. Before we do that, we need a Verilog design. So I did a little simple Verilog design. I talk about it in the post, but I wanted to do a video to go into a little more detail on it and just kind of show you what's going on here. Uh, the Verilog program that we're going to do in this particular video is just a combinatorial circuit. It's actually an adder. It's going to take two binary digits, two bits, add them together, and produce a sum and a carry. That seems pretty simple. We'll extend that later, but that's a good thing to start out with is something simple and manageable. There's a lot of ways you can work in Verilog. We're going to simulate our Verilog to make sure it's correct before we push it down into the chip. And there's a couple of different programs you could use for that. Icarus Verilog is very popular. Uh, I'm going to use EDA Playground, which is actually in your web browser. And in fact, it really is using other tools for it. One of those tools is Icarus, if you really want to use Icarus. And you can do that on your desktop. So all of these are tools that you could potentially either download or buy. Uh, and you can see there's some other tools that we won't talk about. But for Verilog, we're going to use one of these simulators. I'm just going to take the default one for this. So let's look at our design. The design is actually over here on the right. I'll talk about what's over on the left here in a minute. But over here on the right, you can see some comments. And there's a line here that says default net type none. I'll talk more about that in part two. But that prevents the Verilog simulator from just letting you make up names at random. So you basically have to declare the variables that you're going to use. And if you don't, that's an error. Without that statement, if you make up a variable name or more likely you misspell something, the simulator will just say, oh, I guess you wanted to make a variable of that name, so I'll do that for you and I won't complain. And that's a constant source of errors. So you almost always want to have that line in there. Verilog code resides in modules. A module is like a component. We can instantiate modules, kind of like think of a C++ class, sort of. You can't take that analogy too far. But this module is called Demo. It's got some outputs. You can see five LEDs that correspond to the five LEDs on the ice stick board. And then I've got two inputs here. And those inputs correspond to the PMOD socket. There's two pins on there. We'll add some more inputs later. But for now, I've just got these two inputs. So that's essentially telling it that there's this module with all the code in it. In this particular simple case, I'm really only going to have one module. But in a more complex case, I could have this module include other modules. And we'll see an example of that in the test bench, which I'll talk about in a minute. But for now, all our code for the actual FPGA is going to go in this module demo. I didn't like those names, the LED 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They're very descriptive, but I wanted some more usable names, especially for the inputs. And so I aliased them. I created a wire. That's a type of net in Verilog, or a variable, if you want to think of it that way, called NA, and another wire called NB. There's another kind of variable we won't talk about until next time called a reg, which is short for register. And they're different. There's some different rules for them. But for right now, we're just going to work with wires. And I have an assigned statement. Uh, NA is PMOD1. NB is PMOD2. This is an unusual use of the assigned statement. I'm essentially making an alias between those two things. What's key about the assign statement, though, is it's not like a piece of C code where it actually executes this and then executes that. What you're really doing is you're building, in this case, a wire that connects from PMOD1 to NA. And that wire is all the time. Just like if you solder some wire onto a perf board, that connection is all the time, not just when you look at it and then maybe a couple hundred milliseconds later and then a couple hundred milliseconds later like it would be in a piece of software. It literally is connecting those two things together. So then I've got another wire for carry. There's a reason I've done that. I've got, I'm have got. i going to use the carry in a couple of places later. So I've planned ahead and made a variable for that. But for the sum, I'm just going to drive that out to LED1. And so I didn't make a separate wire for that. And there's a couple of ways you can go. I'm going to uncomment these two lines here. And then I'm going to comment these lines back out. And this will show us one method to do it. If you look in the post, there's a schematic of the 
adder, and it's essentially very simple. The sum is the exclusive or the inputs, and the carry is the and of the inputs. And this style of writing Verilog is essentially just transliterating the logic diagram into Verilog. So there's an exclusive OR gate, just like in C or C++, that little caret character is a uh, exclusive OR, and the ampersand is an AND. We've already talked about the assign. This literally says make an XOR gate with two inputs, and the output goes to LED1. And this says make an AND gate with two inputs, and put it into the carry wire. And that's certainly an adder. And then since I want carry to come out to LED2, I've got another alias here, assign LED2 equal carry. That might seem wasteful, but the tools that build this will kind of find those kind of equivalences and factor them all out. So readability is king here, and once we go down to the FPGA, there's not really going to be a difference between those alias signals. And then that's the end of the module. So this is one way to do it. We'll talk about this part that's in comments here later. But for right now, this is the very simplest way to go. Now over here on the left is your test bench. We're going to do a simulation. So in order to simulate it, we need to create one of these demo modules, and we need to feed it some sort of test stimulus and see if we think the output is going to be the same or not. Uh, the same as what we expect. So again, I've got my default net type. This is just another Verilog file. And it says module TB, that's test bench. It doesn't have any arguments. If you notice, this one takes a bunch of ports, inputs and outputs. This one doesn't. And we're never going to push this test bench down to the FPGA. This is just for us to do our testing with. And I've got my stimulus. There's one of those rig variables, A and B. The difference here, that's really more like a variable in a programming language where you set it to something and it stays. That's why it's a register as opposed to a wire where you make a connection between something. It's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. And then here we've got a bunch of wires that just hook up to the LEDs. I'm going to create a demo instantiation. So that demo over here is the same as this demo here, and I'm calling it DUT, which is a common acronym for device under test. And I'm hooking up all these different signals, the LED 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A and B, and you notice they're in the same order as they are over here on the right. Normally, when I'm going to send Verilog down to the FPGA, there's certain things that I can't do in Verilog uh, that it, it won't go down to the FPGA. Those things are called non-synthesizable. And in the test bench, though, I can do all those things because I'm never going to synthesize it to the FPGA. I'm just going to run it in the simulator. So the initial block is one of those. Most synthesis tools ignore the initial block, or at the very least have severe restrictions on what you can do. But that initial block just means, hey, when you get started, do the things in here. And the way Verilog works, if I don't do anything special, everything in that block happens at the exact same time. Now that's not going to be true in the simulator, but the simulator will pretend like it is, and it will take steps to make sure that that everything appears to go at the same time unless we do something special. And we, we don't want everything to go at the same time, so we are going to do something special here. Uh, the first two lines, this dump file and dump vars, this is just housekeeping to say, hey, go dump everything that you see on that device under test into this file. And EDA Playground is looking for that file name, so you really can't change it here. If you were using Icarus, for example, on your desktop, you could make that file anything you want and then you'd use something like GTK Wave or something like that to actually view the waveforms. We're going to use EDA Playground for that as well, so we just need to put this in. It's almost boilerplate. And I'm going to start my A and B variables up to be zero. That one apostrophe notation there, that means a one-bit binary number with a zero in it. And so obviously if I had had 8 bits, which I don't, I would have 8 apostrophe. And if I wanted to write them in hex, I could write an H there instead of a B. And there's some other possibilities. But that strange notation just means single binary bit 0. Now, now you've got the hash mark, or it's actually an octothorpe, but most people don't know that. I've got the uh, hash 2, or pound sign, which I know is not a good thing to call it in the UK. Uh, I've got the pound sign 2. That says delay two simulation cycles. So 
the way the simulator works is he's going to say, okay, time is zero, time is one, time is two, time is three, and this just says wait two cycles before you keep going. So after two cycles, I'm going to change A to one, and I'm going to wait four cycles. I just pick two and four, no particular reason for them. And then I'm going to change B to one. Now I'm going to change A back to zero after another delay. And now I'm going to change B to zero. I'm going to wait a little bit to see what happens, and then I'm going to say dollar finish, which tells the simulator to stop. So, you know, obviously the sum and the carry ought to be zero when, at this point. When I make A one, the sum should be one, because one plus zero is one, but the carry should be zero. When I make B one, I should get a carry, but I would have a sum of zero now, because one plus one is one zero, so the sum bit is zero and the carry bit's one. And then when I bring A to zero, I'll go back to having just a sum of one, because B will still be one. And then when I bring B back to zero, I'll go back to being zero zero. So if I, if my design over on the right is correct, when I simulate this, that's what I should see. So let's try that. I'm going to save it. You get a little screen blinking there. I don't really need any of these tools. I do need to make sure Verilog is picked here. You notice it says System Verilog slash Verilog. System Verilog has some extra features for doing test benches. We're not going to talk about those. There's also some libraries that you may use. We're not going to use any of those. We've already picked the tools. There's options you can put on there. The defaults are fine for us, but this one is important. We need to open EP Wave after run. That needs to be checked, and you'll see why in just a second. So when I click Run, you'll see some messages come down here at the bottom. And if I didn't make any mistakes, so from EP Wave we can look and see the results of the simulation. You'll see that NA and NB did what we thought they should, or what we told them to do. One became one, then the other became one, and then they went back to zero. The LED one is the sum, and in fact it goes to a one comes back to a zero and up to a one again. And LED2 is the carry, and it does what we think as well. You'll notice from the simulator I can also look at all these internal signals, so it's very useful to be able to go see exactly what's happening inside. This design's pretty simple, so you know what's going on outside is pretty much what's going on inside, but that's not true if you've got something more uh, complex. And so, again, this is pretty simple. We'll see better examples of this. You can zoom in and out, and you can scroll back and forth, and there's a few other little items that you can do here. If you had multi-bit numbers, you can show whether you want them in hex or binary. And so, pretty powerful way to look at your, your Verilog simulation output. I'm going to close this, and I'm going to come back over here, because I wanted to look at that. We, we've got the exclusive OR gate and the AND gate, like I said. That's a pretty naive way to code this, and for a simple circuit like this, it's probably as good as anything else. But most of the time, our circuits are going to be a lot more complex. And one of my favorite examples of this is a seven-segment decoder, right? It takes a four-bit number in and drives a seven-segment display. And yeah, you can go figure out how to do that with the AND gates and the OR gates and some NOT gates and work out all the logic for which numbers drive which segments, and you could do that. And you could write it in Verilog like that, just like we wrote this simple adder. But that's really painful, and it gets very error-prone, and it's just a lot of work to do. It's much easier to say, hey, Verilog, here's a 4-bit number, and by the way, if it's a 0, light up these segments, and if it's a 1, light up these segments, and there's like a case statement for that. Uh, this is similar to like a switch case, you know, statement in C, and, and that would be very easy to do. You can find more about that in the post. The point is, is the Verilog system can pick up what you intend, and then it will decide what circuitry is required to make that. And that's really, really powerful. It's called inference. So it can infer, oh look, you wanted an adder here, or you wanted a seven-segment decoder here, or you wanted a flip-flop here. We'll talk about flip-flops next time. So I'm going to show you a different way that we could do the same circuit. I'm going to go in here and comment that part out. And now I'm going to make a 2-bit 
entity full sum. It's got bits 0 and 1. It's a wire. And that means it's two bits. The bit 1 is the most significant bit. Bit 0 is the least significant bit. And I'm going to tell it to assign full sim is equal to NA and NB. And you see the curly braces and the bits there. That's essentially concatenating those things together. So I'm turning those into two-bit numbers instead of one-bit numbers. So now I'm going to get if A was 1, that number is going to be 0, 1. And if B was 0, that's going to be 0, 0. And I'm going to tell it to add it. And it's going to generate probably the very same thing that I've got here to do that addition. And now all I need to do to get my sum and carry is to go pull the bits out of full sum. So full sum 0 is put into LED 1. Full sum 1, which is the carry, is put into the carry. And then once again, the carry goes to LED 2. Now, uh, granted, you look at this, you say, well, that's really not simple at all. And you're right. For this simple example, it's probably just as well to have done it the other way. But, again, think about that seven-segment decoder or an arithmetic logic unit for a CPU. It gets very convenient to describe things like this in a more programming language fashion and let the compiler figure out how to map that down into actual gates and constructs. So let's just make sure this still does the same thing that we thought it does. We don't have to change the test bench at all because we should get the same function. So when I press run, it takes a second. Now this is interesting here. It says use the get signals button to add more signals to the waveform view. So there's some threshold where it decides it doesn't just want to show you everything like it did last time. So we're going to click on get signals. And you can see that if there were more than one module here that we were looking at, they would all be displayed here. And here's all the signals that are in there. I could hit a append all and basically get the same display we got before. But I'm going to pick just my first two LEDs, and I'll pick NA and NB, and I'll append selected. And now there's the same basic display that we had before. So the inputs are doing what we think they should, the sum is doing what we think it should do, and the carry is doing what we think it should do. So if you break it up into little pieces like that, it's not really very hard. Uh, you know, the important thing to remember is this is not a programming language where it does this line, then it does that line, then it does the other line. It actually is building circuitry, and that circuitry works all the time. And that's a little different over here in the test bench where we've done something special to make it more like a program where it says, okay, let's do this, let's wait a little bit, let's do this, let's wait a little bit. That's typically not synthesizable. You could not push this code down to the FPGA if you wanted to. But the synthesizable code here will handily turn into circuitry. And shortly, not in this video, but in an upcoming video, we'll talk about how to use the open source ice storm tools to actually program the FPGA. So part two, we'll talk about sequential circuits, that is circuits with flip-flops and clocks and why they're important. And we'll add some to this example to do that. In particular, we'll latch the carry line and we'll also have some counters to blink some of the other LEDs that we're not using. So be sure to tune in for that. But meanwhile, uh, you can actually open this up on EDA Playground, run it yourself, make changes to it, and kind of test your understanding of it. And thanks for watching.